Conley. Gurmil Marga de Cahirli of the Sun, Falchero of Agisa, Cogorgicus, Dunke do Reefta, Cotrimi of Inchkina, Egest, Majorle, Mano or Sarko. So, Jane Talk of Gurmania. You're very welcome. And Mr. Michon, I was very impressed with your opening statement, and I was about to congratulate you until you started to talk about Thurdus New and C Tech okay. and a, num a number of other matters. But certainly, your opening statement uh, is to be welcomed, mm -hmm. and you put social welfare in context. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly, nine, the biggest budget, I think, from the government, isn't it? Over 19 billion. And, and you say it will affect every single person. That budget, so one way or another, all of us will benefit from that budget at some stage in our life. Is that right? Whether through pensions or that's right. That's I mean, correct. even yeah. child benefit. Yeah. You know, yeah. all those payments. Okay. Also, what jumps out at me looking at all of this is that the so-called free market is not free at all. Government taxpayers' money backs up the free market all of the time in helping employers to employ people and so on. Isn't that right? And so a substantial amount of that budget goes to the so-called free market that is certainly not free and is certainly functioning on the basis of taxpayers' money. Isn't that right? Yeah, I think I don't think you'll find any economist, even deputy, who would argue with you that the free market is, in that sense, it's a misnomer. It's, it's not, there's a cost, and um, whether that cost is on the IDA providing grants or whether it's on tax reliefs yes. or whether it's on us providing employment supports, and it's where the state steps in, because if the market was completely free, if we let it be completely free, yeah. you'd be back, which it's, is where... It's, it's utterly free in relation to housing, which I come back to, and the rent supplement. And it's utterly free in the narrative of each government. But the actual reality on the ground is the taxpayers' money, the market couldn't function without taxpayers' money, one way or another, in terms of low wages, where the government steps mm -hmm. in, and so on. Isn't that right? That's a, I, okay, I think it's just important to put it in perspective. I, I, I'd agree. I don't yeah. disagree. I'd, I'd probably yeah. say it slightly differently. I agree with your point. I'd probably yeah. say it slightly differently. I think I'd say society couldn't function. Yes. And, you know, society is based on the free market. So that's the so-called. I think it's, it might be called liberal. It might be a better term than free. I don't because know if society is based on the free market, but this, the free market has been imposed on society at a great cost at a great cost. We well. have eight people dead since August. So we're going to start now with a few, just so I, they're, they're my compliments okay. and well done. Secondly, I'd like to say thank you for the contact number for TDs. Mm -hmm. Certainly my experience and my office experience of that, not, <coughs> not that we get our own way, mm -hmm. but we're treated with um, mm -hmm. um, politeness, speed, and I want to thank you for that and professionalism. I, I want to say that publicly. Now, I just want to go into a number of matters in relation to job path has been done to death here today, and rightly so. And you mentioned I, Daniel Blake, and I certainly think there are, if not, we're in danger of following the path that has been so um, poignantly shown in that film. And I think the two companies that you've chosen certainly have put us in danger here in relation to that. I'm going to leave the commercially sensitive and the cost of it for the moment. And what I want to focus on is the effect of that on a community employment schemes. And we had Udaros Nguyeltuk the Osar Kor de March. August Kursi the Nulduin, Gach Gopaibli, Gowil Jack Rukdan, Ohiv Nishkemanisho. August community employment schemes. Udros Nguyeltuk that confirmed to us, and they said they are in the process of writing to you in relation to the impact of Thuris Nua and CTEC, in which everyone applies in the west of Ireland, the direct impact on community employment schemes. Now, I haven't heard that from you today, Mr. McKeown, and I, that's my experience. That's Udros Nguyeltuk and that's the cooperative movement who have made many presentations to us telling us that they cannot get people for their schemes, and their schemes are being seriously impacted. So that's my first observation and question. Well, just on that one, I'll refer back and maybe say it a little bit more elegantly, uh, a point I made, I made earlier. There are currently about 22,000 people on community employment schemes around the country. In 2012, which was really the height of the um, recession, we had 21,000. So there's actually nearly 1,000 people more on community employment schemes now than there was then. I, I, and, and just across the country, and job path has been introduced since then. So it hasn't, at an aggregate level, when you look at it, there's no apparent impact. 
Let, let me just stop you there now, because I've heard that, yeah. and I've heard you say that, and I, I don't want to. I don't want it repeated as yeah. a stock answer. Yeah. I know that you have what you're saying. I'm saying, oh, the Ross Nagoyal thought they've told us publicly our experience on the ground and the cooperative movement, which was in the Dáil recently and across in the hotel, telling us the serious difficulties and, that and they're experiencing. Uh, so, now, what I'm asking you is, have you done a review? You're quite you're familiar that they're. Yeah. unhappy with the situation. We've had a look at it and we've had a look at a number of individual cases. I can't recall that Udras Nagel did the one but yeah. perhaps he did as well. And we've had a look at a number of them. In all of those cases there have been people available on the live register who are long term unemployed who are available who could have been uh, referred to the community employment place. The difficulty is when you tease beneath it is that we probably need to have a different model of engagement between the people on our long-term unemployed register and the community employment companies to get more of the people who are not currently aware or applying for community employment places to go on them. If I contrast it with TUS, for example, which is a very similar scheme, but the difference with TUS is that the people are selected by the department and referred to community employment. Community employment sponsors advertise their positions and then they wait for applicants. And it, it, what we need to do, I think it's a, on the department, and this is something we're looking at, we need to be a little bit more active in talking to the 40,000 people who are long-term unemployed who are not on any other scheme at the moment to say, listen, these vacancies are there, we want you to apply for them. We also need, and this is some, a little bit difficult to say because it actually runs against my own personal grain a bit, but nevertheless I think there's evidence of it, is community employment businesses, certainly the one or two cases I've looked at myself, when I scratched beneath the surface, it wasn't so much that I couldn't get somebody, but I couldn't get the calibre of person or the exact person that they wanted the way they could in 2012. And that's because the number no, of people no, are no, longer. No, no, I'm no, just no, saying the one or two cases I'm speaking no, no, about. Okay, you can speak about one or two cases, Mr yeah. McKeown, but what I'm highlighting is not me personally. Yeah. I'm highlighting the cooperative movement that was before us. I'm hi highlighting Udras Nguel mm -hmm. So at the very least, I would ask that you sit down with these organisations and you say, what's going on here? What difficulties are you experiencing? And we absolutely and will, Deputy. Well, you will. haven't, just, just Mr McKeown, you haven't. And in your opening statement, you referred, and I, and I respect you for this, and I agree with you, we recognise the value of non-market activity. Mm. You give examples such as caring and homemaking. Mm. I would give the example of the community employment schemes and these schemes. This, this society couldn't function without it. And I don't think that actually, the reason I stopped complimenting you because you went on to talk about work as being very important while not mentioning this as work. And you talked about this as a preparation for work. Mm. In my opinion, this is absolutely invaluable work on the community employment schemes. All over this country, cooperatives are, are functioning because of that. Just about, mind you, just about. So I would ask you to relook at that and to sit with the various organisations. And we've had the privilege on the Cush de Guelga, August Dashtel Mij Trij, on Tier, August on Rud Igoni, who will ask before you, De War Tech, August De War Taurus Nua. They're telling us. So there's, some, there's a disconnect, there's a cognitive dissonance, or there's something going on here. So I would, I'm going to park it and ask you to come back in relation to that. Okay, if I can just say, yeah. we will absolutely talk to Udras Nikhail, like the, you know, following your interview. Absolutely, we'll talk to them. They're in the process of writing to you, I okay. understand. Ab we'll said. absolutely yeah. talk to them. And uh, 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 Kathleen, who's here, has overall responsibility for community employment, and she, right. together with our divisional right. manager in, in Goliath, um, Owen Brown will talk to Udras Nikhail. Like the, uh, and, and all so the cooperatives, I'm, I'm using the, the word, the English word, um, core common. Core common, yeah. I could the public bunny here. I was Cathy Nigail Marhampla, Vichy on Chuff, we go, a car in Nuldum called Jacarus Okay, we'll okay. absolutely do okay. that. I, I just on the point of community employment and the value of it, we in our department absolutely recognise the value of community employment. And don't well, get that, me wrong. Just, that wasn't apparent. Just, it but wasn't, I suppose yeah. what we've done, sorry, where deputy is, we've done a review of community employment recently and we've decided with government approval. Um, to designate two types of community employment places. Um, those which are activation places, which their primary purpose is to help somebody move on into employment, and those that are social inclusion, their primary purpose is to give occupational activity to the person, plus provide a valuable local service. So we, we are looking at it through right. that lens. Is that review available to us? 
Uh, I yeah. Great. I'd love to look at that for we a few minutes. We can send it on to you. Thank you. Just, just in, for, before I move off this topic in relation to, it's also our experience on the ground that you have to go with Taurus Nua or CTEC. You don't have a choice. You're telling me you have a choice. The replies to parliamentary questions tells me you have a choice. We're being told on the ground. You simply do not have a choice. And if you're called for I, by either of these organisations, you have to take it up. You cannot go on a, on a thing. So again, I'm not going to waste my time because you've told me that's not true, that's not accurate, but that's our experience on and the ground. I just want to clarify that. If, if a person is selected uh, for referral to a job path provider, in the same way as if they're selected for two yeah they are required to participate. There is an exception made where a person has, during the same period, got, it, got, got a offer. CE offer, and then they can choose between the two. Just but for somebody who hasn't received an offer, they, they're, they're required to attend. They are required to attend unless they have an offer in their hands to go on, a, on the other yeah. schemes. Or, 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 I'll just clarify whether it's an offer or an application, but if, if they're in the process okay. of taking up a CE offer, okay. it is an offer. Well, an, an offer. An offer. Start date for, within four weeks. I saw that in the reply that came back. So I'm going to park that. I look forward to reading the review and I look forward to you t taking up these difficulties with the relevant organisations. In relation to rent supplement, I think that's that. 250, sorry, I'm, I'm going to deal with um, uh, home help. And the point has been made by Deputy McSharry, a carer's allowance. And I welcome that the Department of Public Expenditure is now going to look at that. It seems the most... I'll just clarify that. I will bring this back for consideration. I understand. So, I, I'm not so that yeah. the, for the avoidance of doubt in that. Yeah. Yeah. No, you made that clear. But it struck me as well, and I have it here on page uh, 29, and the carer's allowance. And it, for 65,740 people, it's dealing with that number of people at a cost of 653 million. Okay. Now, obviously, we cannot begin to put a price on the value of what carers are doing at home. Most of them at breaking point, at love, out of love for, for the person they're caring for. On the other hand, then, we have the, what I call the unfair deal, but the fair deal. Let's stick to the uh, terminology. And the fair deal covers approximately 23,000 people, and the cost is 917 million this, this year. A billion. What year was that? 17. 17. We're up at a billion. Now, obviously, it makes sense for the Department of Public Expenditure to immediately and urgently look at this matter. If 23,000 people in care at a cost of almost a billion, and then this amount of people struggling, struggling under a pittance really, saving the state a fortune. It's extraordinary that it takes a public accounts committee to say, look at this, and even then I understand you're restricted and you're given a very nuanced answer. But doesn't it make sense that that would be the first thing to look at in terms of value for money? I have no comment on that. No comment. No. Okay. Okay. Rent supplement. Just clarify for me rent supplement. Rent supplement was always administered by Department of Social Welfare, isn't that right? And then the process is changing to the HAP payment slowly. What is the total figure for all of the assistance for rent? The rent supplicant, RAS, HAP? Um, maybe I'll ask... Um uh, Helen, to cover on this, but the funding in 2017 for rent supplement HAP and the rental accommodation scheme is about 540 million. In 2017. 2017. I think that's right, Helen. Is it? Yeah. 540 um, million. 540 million. Um, rent supplement accounts for um, 253 million. Yes. And there's about currently now about 35,000 recipients of it. Um, the housing assistance payment is 153 million, and currently now there's over 30,000 recipients. Yes. And the rental accommodation scheme yes. is 134 million, yes. and there's about 34,300 recipients. Just that last one, 34. Uh, Raz, yeah. 134 million, yeah. and 34,300 recipients. So all in all, that's about 99,000 individuals and families um, supported. In um, the 99,000 households, 
It, it's some, no, it's some individuals and families, so a household, but the yeah. household could be a single it's, it's household. just one payment per household, obviously. So yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. But the household could be one or ten. Absolutely. Okay. So 99,000 99, are in receipt of some payment under 540 million yes. for this year alone. For this year alone. That's, some free, that's some free market. It represents about 30% of private tenancies registered with the Residential Tenancies Board. Say that again. Um, about 30% 30 of so private increase. tenancies registered with the Residential Tenancies Board. So, and presumably that figure is going to continue to rise now with government policy that HAP is, is the way. It's, it's a government policy to try and support people who don't have access to accommodation from any other means. No, I, I have no problem with the support, yeah. but it, what's happening is that that percentage will now rise in a market where there are no houses available. Isn't that right? It's, it's at 30 per cent now, and yes. it will continue to rise in a market where no houses are available and where the construction of public housing is at an all-time low. Yes. So 540 million is going directly into the private market. Yes. With consequences of rising rents? Well, there's a number of provisions in place, um, Deputy, to try and manage the, the, the rent levels. The 4% per year in the, in yes. the rent pressure zones. Yes. And so Galway is one of those. And so what we have are more and more tenants coming into my office and other people's offices getting notices to quit under ostensibly notices for sale, but there's no for sale really, and they have no choice. If they fight, if they go to the uh, authority in Dublin, they will get no uh, reference. They're caught in a crazy situation, let me tell you. But I, th that's all policy by the government. OK, I'm going to just move on to a few more things. The Gaeltacht. What welfare officers or what offices are in, in the Gaeltacht in Galway, the biggest Gaeltacht in the country? What services are provided in Irish by your department? We, we have officers in our Galway office and uh, that are capable of... Well, I'd love, Gal I'd love if Galway was classified as Gaeltacht, Irish. but it's not yet. It's a, it's a bilingual yeah. I mean, city. I think we have our, our, our main office for that area is the Galway Info Centre, um, and that's where clients in that region would be referred to. Um, just to Mr. McEwen, just my question was, what offices are based in the Gaeltacht, the largest Gaeltacht in the country? That was my question. OK. Uh, Clifton... Galway. Clifton is not a Gaeltacht. They're, they're the two offices we have in that region. Okay, so you've no office in the Gaeltacht. Um, I'd need to check. That we have a branch office, but we have we have a branch office. It wouldn't be one of our own offices. What, what is? Uh, just I'd need to come back to you on that. No, this the, is a very important question no, in terms of understand. the Gaeltacht and our obligations under. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Or, 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 under the constitution, not to mention various pieces of legislation, yeah. Yeah. was there? Were how many branches, how many offices, whatever the appropriate <coughs> terminology is, in the Gaeltacht before this? No, we've always had an office in Galway and Clifton, um, and they'd be the two main offices I, covering I that region. I that there were welfare officers or community, whatever. There would be community was, employment on. officers yeah. uh, or community uh, welfare officers. Um, and they would have a number of satellite clinics in the area. We have reduced the number around the country generally in order, actually, I, I know this is going to sound contradictory, but it actually is, is to improve service um, because we had 900 satellite offices which are costing quite a lot of money and we've now reduced that to about 200. Just, just, um, Mr McEwen, just on that now, can you come back to me about mm. what service a Toshivsha, a Xalohar, three Gwelga, Sigwiltok, this Mosa Tier, August Nagwiltok, the Ella, Mosha the Hella. Absolutely. We will. Okay. In relation to cost effectiveness, we have a serious traffic problem in Galway. And your policy and other government policies are drawing more and more people as Jaku Giacar something that is not sustainable. So when you're looking at costs, you might look at the costs that are not counted in, in terms of extra traffic on the road, serious congestion, climate change implications and so on, not to mention the language. So if you could come back to me, please, in a letter setting out that, we what will. services you're providing. We will, absolutely. And what changes have been made in the last few years? We will, absolutely. Okay, Mahgut, in yeah, relation to Just fraud, as I can mention, yeah. we are developing a lot of online services as well. Um, and three they will, obviously. Three 
Okay, okay, thank you, May. Branoi Mayshin. So, back again now just to the fraud and error, and I think it's been clarified, and I think you've been very fair. And actually, I find myself disagreeing to a certain extent with the Controller and Auditor General uh, in his report on um, reviews and medical reviews uh, for the first time in almost two years on this committee. And I I'm more on your side in what you're saying in relation to. Um, uh, various matters, the domiciliary care in particular and so on. Now what I want to ask is, in terms of fraud and error, and it's been teased out by my colleagues here, is it fair to say that error is the higher percentage of the error rather than fraud of yes. the overpayments? Yes. Because I'm just going to repeat that now because we have to balance up what was put on the buses. So not fraud, error. Yes. Good. And so error didn't appear on the buses, did it? No. Good. But yeah. So why was that? Well, the, as I said earlier, the Deputy, there was three, three dimensions to that campaign. There no, was no. My question was, why didn't error appear on the buses? We ran with the marketing campaign, which was designed for us by a professional communications and company. And who gave the instructions to that marketing? We, the department did. The department. Mm. Okay. And was the minister involved in that? The minister would have seen, and, the, and I think that he signed off on the campaign before it went, but okay. the department so, did the work on okay, it. Okay, lovely. And when you, when you were doing this, did you not say, oh, hold on a second, minister, actually, it's not fraud at all, it's error? Well, as I said in the earlier answers, there's three dimensions to it. No, we no. Need did, to did you say that to the minister? Sorry. Oh, the minister had been aware that the, the okay, larger proportion... Did you proportion say to the minister, look, minister, you shouldn't really run with this. We, 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 we've decided on this, but now we realise error is the bigger... No, as I, as I said earlier, the view in the department was it was appropriate to run a communications campaign. Well, I, and I it was it in the fraud and error strategy of the department it, 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 before the minister ever joined. It, it undermined... And we've learned from it, Deputy, as I said okay, earlier. I accept that, and I'm not one to trump. You've, you've, said, you've said, given an apology, and I accept that. But the thing is, it did the most terrible damage to your department and the tremendous work you're doing. This, we've agreed society couldn't function without your, your uh, services and without taxpayers' money. It, it was a damning, damning. And it reflects more on the minister and the government, let me say. Well, I mean, I, I, I'm not going to comment on that. In relation that to definitely. employer fraud. What's the percentage in relation to employer fraud? Well, the employer fraud, I mean, we, we, the payments that we make to employers on the welfare side are um, payments in respect of predominantly the wage subsidy scheme and in the jobs plus uh, scheme, their recruitment subsidies, and they're entirely contingent on the person being in employment. And we haven't detected any fraud. Yeah, I in, thought there on was a side. reference somewhere into employer fraud. No, there, we, there are employers that we would, and I, there is a number, I'll have to try and dig it up with respect to employers who haven't properly registered staff or PRSI, and, and, but it's a relatively low number. I'll, I'll try and dig it up in the papers. Okay. Um, the, the bigger proportion, and I, I know, of employer issues we have would be on the redundancy and insolvency side. Okay. where there is a rebate okay. paid, and that's where the bigger issue with employers okay. is. Okay. In relation to domestic violence and letters gone out, mm. I raised this in the Dáil recently, and so did other TDs. That has been changed. There's a new policy in relation to it. Can you just clarify the policy that the okay. type of letter that went out? I know the Minister has explained in the Dáil, that's, and I'll finish then. I want to just finish with domiciliary care okay. allowance. Okay. Yeah. Just on the employers one, yeah. I just got there were six employers prosecuted last six, year. Six, six employers. Okay. Oh. What, what, what was the money involved or what was the... Ooh, well, we, we might come back to you with that okay. data, if that's okay, Deputy. Okay. On, the, on the case of the domestic violence, it's not so much just been a change in policy as that there was an well, error made Lord, by... I hope there was a change in policy. No, no, sorry. There, yeah. there was an error made in the, by an individual in applying the policy correctly, <laughs> um, and we, we've dealt with that. Um, and we're also working with the National Women's Council to improve our communications and to make sure that we apply the policy correctly in future, that the scope for error is diminished. I, I think, I think it's fair to say more than one, Are you saying that one person sent out all of the letters that were sent out? No, no, the, the letters are a separate issue. There were two issues. One yes. was the, 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 the letters which go out telling people that um, you, you, you need to be trying to recover funds from... Uh, a person who has maintenance obligations to her children. And, and that is the case. That is the law. That is the case. However, it is not the case that a person who is in a domestic violence situation is required to contact their former partner to, to, to do that. So the, the, the staff member who incorrectly 
told uh, a, a victim of uh, domestic abuse that they had to go and get this evidence, did so in error, contacted the individual subsequently and apologised for the Mr. error Kuhl, and so I, on. I understand. I don't mean to individualise this. There was more than one letter. The minister acknowledged that oh, in the yeah. doll. So what I'm asking is, I'm asking you just to confirm. She said there was training in place mm -hmm. for staff. Mm -hmm. There would be ongoing training. That the nature of the letter would be changed dramatically yeah. as a result of consultation. Is that correct? That's that, all. That is correct. And that, so that's okay. That okay. is correct. Because when we reduce it to one person, we're ignoring mm -hmm. what happened rather than learning from what happened. I, know, I, I accept, yeah. accept there are two learnings yeah. from it. Yeah. There was the yeah. quality of our communications, which I mentioned, and we're looking at improving that with the National Women's Council. Okay. And there was the individual instance of error. Oh, yeah. Women's Aid. Sorry, apologies. Women's, women's Aid. Right. We're, we're the, the final forward. question was on domiciliary care alongs, and again, Deputy Murphy has raised this. My experience on the ground in the past is impossible for them to get it, really. So I, I'm wondering, uh, they have it, like, things have improved, but somebody going forward for a domiciliary care allowance for their child. I imagine the level of fraud is, is zilch, I imagine, number one. And number two, there was to, supposed to be a review, you, uh, a working review from 2013. Now, the, the, attorney, the controller and auditor general seems to be saying there should be medical reviews in relation to this, which I disagree with, but I'm no expert. But I, I, I think people come, families coming forward for this should be facilitated in every possible way if there's a, a medical assessment that says they need it. And I'm not sure that there's a need for further reviews. So I'm, what's your views on that? And what happened from 2013 onwards from the working or the implementation group that was set up? By domiciliary care allowance, it's a payment made in respect of children who have a disability and care needs substantially in excess of another child of the same age and where the care needs are expected to last for at least a year. Um, currently, the award rate on the, at the first initial claim stage is... Just, just one second now. What I have here from, from the controller and auditor general, domiciliary care allowance is payable to carers of children under 16 that have a severe disability that requires constant care and attention, substantially in excess of that required by another child. Severe disability that requires constant care. Is that a wrong quote in the controller and auditor general? No. Um, no. So it's, it's a severe it's, disability? It's generally okay. a severe disability okay. and care needs substantially in excess of another child. Good. So is there a need for ongoing reviews? If, if there's a severe disability, it's a severe disability next year as well, isn't it? Well, sorry, uh, quite a number of the, the claims that come in, the, the, the child has a disability and it's looked at in, in the round and particularly the focus is actually on the care and um, the care that's supplied by the parent or the guardian um, in this case. And that's that's where we've moved on in consultation with a lot of the representative groups, um, enabling the care provider to detail the care in detail, and they, they keep a care diary. And it has allowed us to improve, say, the quality of the decisions. Over 75% are awarded at first claim stage. But, um, for example, some of the claims could be because the, the qualifying age for the scheme reduced from, it was for a child two years upwards. It's now um, from once the child is born. So you could have a premature child who needs a substantial amount of care, but please, God, you know, over time that has improved, etc. So there are cases that, that should be subject to review. Um, but we're working out with the implementation group a process that is fair and that is consistent. And the reviews were suspended because there's quite a number of judicial review cases taken against the department. And in effect, we were um, putting our efforts and energies into processing claims as quickly as possible. Has the number of cases reduced? In terms of the... Judicial the reviews? Sorry, we haven't reviewed. Um, there's a small number of cases were reviewed this year for non-medical no, no, reasons. You said there was quite a number of judicial review oh, sorry, cases. The, the judicial reviews, um, they have, but they're um, subject to, to change at any time. What have they come down from to? No, but it was the nature of, of the judicial review. Yeah. What it required then for the department to amend its processing, um, we had to um, give a, a detailed um, breakdown of the decision-making process to the applicant. Um, in addition, the medical assessors had to give a detailed breakdown of their reasoned opinions, and this took 
extra time and actually caused a delay in, in processing the actual applications. The judicial reviews that Helen is talking about where cases taken in the High Court by individual claimants to, 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 I, I, to do with the decision making process in the department. I, I'm, looking at, oh, I'm looking at something that's so essential for a family to survive and you've clarified that 75% are given at the first level. I welcome that. I welcome the fact that you're clarifying it's at the earlier age that you might be looking. What I don't welcome is it's taking quite a long time and it, it was obviously, you go back to 2013 which was four years ago, a working group was set up and so on. Anyway, I've taken enough time. Thank well, you. Maybe I can just clarify yeah. that for you, for, for you, Deputy. There was a working group set up to come up with policy and administrative recommendations and to also look at a new review process. And that was set up, as you said, in 2013. The administrative recommendations have all been implemented. Have they? Yes. Good. The, Good. Policy Good. Implement the policy recommendations and the reviews have been held up pending these high court cases because we had to get clarity from those. And also, as, as, as Helen mentioned, because we were hit with an influx of new claims and we prioritised clearing the new claims. We've now got the claims under control. The number of claims pending have dropped from over 3,000 to about 1,500. And in the coming months, we'll go back to the policy and the review with okay. the implementation group. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much. I, I feel